Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Liv. Um, thanks for staying out this long. I know there's a break coming up, but there's been a quite a long stint. And um, oops. Uh, so, who am I? Uh, my name's Liv, and I am the editor of Rough Trade. And I know a few of you put your hand up saying you do know what it is, but those of you that don't, I'll do a bit of explaining because it's a little bit complicated. But before I got given the role of editor at Rough Trade, I used to be one of the. Um, I was the online editor of It's Nice That for a few years, and then the features editor also. I'm also the contributing editor of Repost magazine, and I've written for lots of other sort of independent magazines and kind of gone all over the place. After I left, it's nice that I had about six months freelancing where I just kind of started writing for loads of magazines and websites and stuff, but didn't really enjoy it because I kind of really missed having a team around me and I really missed working in a place that you go to every day and I found it a bit lonely. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of having a bit of a bad time, actually, and I was sitting in my flat with my ex-boyfriend, and I was like, oh, I just want to make my own music magazine, and I want to go to New York, and I just want to do more podcasts, and he was like, don't worry, something will come up, like, don't worry about this, it's going to be fine. And then the next day, I got an email via LinkedIn, it does happen, um, and it was from Rough Trade, which is a shop that I actually used to go to when I was a teenager to buy records, um, and... They, yeah, they got in touch and were looking for an editor for a magazine, and so I just kind of jumped at the chance um, and just went nuts, because this place is just honestly like my dream place. To give you a bit of backstory, Rough Trade was a record store set up in 1976 by this guy, Jeff Travis. You can tell it was the 70s. That's the old shop on Kensington Park Road in London. Um, that shop's now moved, and now we have three, uh, four locations actually, two in London, uh, one in New York and one in Nottingham. So it's a big uh, record store, basically. And it's also a record label, but the two are not connected anymore. Not through any kind of unpleasantness, just because they separated. But that's the kind of confusing bit. So I work for the record store. And this is the one that I work in. This is Rough Trade East, which is just off Brick Lane. I don't know if you know it, but if you do, it's just a really, really fun, cool record store. And it's got a cafe, and it's got a radio room, and yeah, I work in there. So yeah, that's the inside. I work on sort of like a kind of mezzanine up on the top left. There's loud music on all day and it's full of great people and it's full of customers bringing in dogs. There's pigeons that fly in. It's kind of a crazy place. It's really, really fun. This is the radio station, um, like a kind of radio recording studio where I do all my podcasts and stuff. So when I got offered this chance to come and work in this place, I was so excited because I just went there all the time anyway and it was just a kind of dream and basically they were looking for an editor to come in and make, for their 40th, 40th birthday basically, make a, a magazine, a monthly printed magazine, 64 pages, that would celebrate the albums of the month and be given out to people who spend a certain amount of money each time they buy something or you can buy it for four pounds. So it would be doing that and running all of their video content to make a new YouTube channel and recording loads of podcasts to do a radio show. And I was like, yeah, sure, fine, I can do all of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I definitely shit didn't. So I kind of turned up and then just kind of, you know, had accepted this job. Like, yeah, cool, don't worry about it, it's going to be fine. Like, yeah, of course. And I sat down at my desk like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. So the magazine was my, most, like, my biggest priority because I've worked in a lot of magazines before but never made my own one. So I looked at, I started looking at what other music magazines there were in London at that time, or in the UK sort of thing. Um, and this is kind of a selection of a couple of ones that you get free in shops or you can buy, whatever. Um, even just looking at those at that time, I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, this is terrifying. And I looked at them all and I thought, okay, well, there's something here that, I, I, there's no point adding to this pile. There's already loads of great magazines that do really in-depth uh, incredible music journalism, really serious portraits, quite gritty music journalism that looks at kind of the music industry as a whole and really hones in on like tiny, tiny techie details. And they all do it very well. Like these are some of the best magazines which I read all the time and they're fantastic. But I wasn't really sure I needed to add to that. So I was thinking about what magazines do I really like anyway. So these are the ones that I would normally read and, and grew up on. Um, Viz, Private Eye, um, I mean, I grew up with my sister bringing back all her copies of like ID and The Face and uh, like Love and Pop from London, and she'd bring them back to my village where I lived, and I'd devour those and stuff. So 
I kind of, what I liked about these magazines, not necessarily Viz and Private Eye, but the more fashion-y magazines and smash hits is that everyone on all the pages is just really happy and having a great time. And they're talking about really kind of funny things. And you want to be part of this club when you like, read it. You're like, oh, I wish I was hanging out with those guys. And everyone seems to be friends and getting on really well. So I was kind of thinking about that. And then I was like, got, kind of getting to the stage of knowing what I was doing. And then, yeah, then I kind of realized, oh shit, like, I actually don't know how to make or design a magazine. So I had this kind of idea in my head of what it could be, um, but absolutely no idea how to go about doing it. So there was the people at Rough Trade were like, oh yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll get someone who works in marketing to do it. And I was like, okay, cool, um, to design the magazine. And I was like, oh, I'm not really sure about that. Um, and it was getting closer and closer to the, the date that I had to go to print with this thing that I was kind of pulling together and we didn't have a designer. So I was really freaking out. And then my friend Bruce called me up and he, he was a friend back from It's Nice That. He's a designer, I knew him really well. And he came into Rough Trade um, and I had a chat to him about it. And he basically agreed to, do, to design the magazine. And this is him. <laughs> the girls love him. He is a fantastic designer, and he's really cute and great and fun. And the minute I told him about what I was trying to do, he just totally understood and got it and just wanted to have fun and saw this as a chance for him to do a monthly magazine with me and just have a bit of fun with it and see what happens. Uh, and yeah, so we've been working together ever since. So when Bruce came in and we agreed to do it, and my boss said that he could do it, I and mean, it was all finalized, um, we kind of had to then work out, OK, this magazine has to go out to the rough trade customers and staff, and it has to basically reflect 40 years of a shop or like an institution that you know, is re people really love. So we had to really get to the heart of what rough trade is. So just to start off with, we went round the shop. So I took Bruce on a kind of walking tour round the shops to show him what it was like. And we looked at all the CDs and the albums and the records, and that was fine. But then I, what I really wanted to show him was like the behind the scenes stuff. It's just a really messy shop. That's basically what it is. It's, it's a record store. And behind the scenes, it's just loads of boxes. There's deliveries. Everyone's kind of pissed off. There's really, like, the floor's really shit. Like, you know, there's stuff like this, like, mirror balls that have been there, like, for, like, 30 years. There's, there's this, it's just, like, it's chaos there. Like, in behind the scenes, is just kind of, it's nuts. Um, and I showed him this, the customer toilets. <laughs> People use those today. 2017, um, but that's kind of part of it, and I love those toilets so much, and if they ever got painted over, I would just be devastated. But I wanted to show Bruce like, what this place was in terms of it being a bit sort of squidgy around the edges and a bit kind of, um, just to get like, the real heart of it, and I think the heart of Rough Trade does lie in its toilets, um, sadly. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, on that, we just kind of put some ideas down uh, as what Rough Trade was. So music, obviously, that's really important. It uh, feels like a family, so when you go in there, um, you meet the staff and you talk to the staff and it feels like you're in this kind of cool family. It's not too scary. I think a lot of record stores can be quite intimidating, but Rough Trade, I like to think, is not. Um, well, that could be wrong, I don't really know. Um, and then hangovers, all the staff are always hungover, there's devoted customers, the door is always wide open, even in the blistering cold. Uh, it's got like an amazing history, it's got a reverence, there's swearing. Um, and then the most important thing of all, like the key of all of this, is the staff. Because the staff at Rough Trade are just, they're all ages. They go from like 17 to, I think it's like 65. And there's this kind of strange hodgepodge of people who have just come together to sell records. And I've never met people who are more passionate about music. This is some of them here. Um, and everyone, it's kind of a bit like being in a film sometimes, or like a sitcom, because everyone's just totally different and passionate, and there's a lot of you know, passion flying around, and it can be quite funny, but also quite tense, and yeah. But really, their encyclopedic knowledge of music and how much they love that shop was something that I was kind of terrified of, either getting wrong or um, kind of misjudging with the magazine. Because I, I was just a woman that came in, and the directors had hired me in, and actually, when I got there, it, I realized quite quickly that a lot of the staff didn't want a magazine and they didn't know who I was and they were a bit like, like looking at me like, oh God, what's she going to do? And I didn't get invited to the pub for like three months. And 
it was just really, they were just kind of like keeping me at arm's length. So I was very aware that this is going to be like a really delicate thing to do is to impress these people. And also they all work like really, really, really hard for peanuts money. So I wanted them to kind of be part of it as well and really enjoy it and maybe start writing for it and that kind of thing. So I tentatively started putting feelers out. Um, I'm going to have to hurry up. So this is the first issue of the magazine. Uh, we made a rule just because to go back to this one. Sorry. Um, basically, most music magazines, uh, especially these ones, have a portrait of an artist or a musician on the cover. So we kind of said to ourselves, we'll never do that. And we haven't, we've done it kind of once, but um, it's a kind of a really strict rule for us to just do something a bit different. And so for the first issue, we had a big interview with Charles Bradley, the soul singer, and I'd sent a photographer around to his house in Brooklyn to photograph his pet parrot instead. It's a bit nicer, and it kind of sets a tone of just a bit kind of odd and unexpected. And we have all the contributors on the back page to make it quite open and friendly and to kind of celebrate who is writing for it rather than who they're writing about, which is quite nice. Um, so this is kind of like just to give you an idea of what the first issue looked like. It's changed quite a lot since then. These are pieces of writing by staff and customers, people who are kind of coming forward being like, oh yeah, I'll write something. Um, and I got, the, I got some staff to just recommend some music for staff picks. That did take a long time to get them to warm up to it, but now they're quite happy doing it. Um, interview with Charles Bradley in the store. And that's one of Charles Bradley's oil paintings that we used for the inside front and back cover. And the horoscope by Andrew Weatherall, who's a very angry DJ. Uh, so then after that, I was like, cool, I'm done, great, cool, whatever. Um, I felt like all the battle had, was over and, you know, I could just kind of sit back and relax. But then I realized that I've got to make one of these things every two weeks. Um, so a 64-page magazine on my own every two weeks, because a week to design, a week to print, it was just like, it, I just suddenly had a bit of a panic attack. So I had to make rules for myself. So, quick methods of making it easy to pull together content for a 64-page magazine every two weeks on your own. Um, so, every month I'm given the top ten albums of the month, um, which rough trade directors decide. They talk to labels and they decide on the top ten albums, so I'm given those. So I'm already given like bands that I kind of should probably contact and work with. So the, but the main feature in the magazine is the album of the month, and it looks a bit like this. So I, I commission all the photographs myself. I don't, we don't use any press photography, um, and I just basically put the artist in conversation with someone else. So this is Angel Olsen, who's a fantastic singer. We put her in conversation with a band called The Raincoats, which is kind of like an amazing punk band from the 70s, 80s. Um, and had them talk to each other. Uh, this is just kind of giving you an idea of what these features look like. This is I sent a photographer out to um, this place, Castlemaine, where this artist lived, and he was like, I don't want to talk to anyone, I don't want to be photographed. And I was like, oh, God. And then I found this photographer, and she was called Jameson, and I sent her out to photograph him, and I think, he, yeah, he said yes to that. But we didn't have a writer, so I just said to Jameson, I'll just take a friend of yours who's into music. So she just took her best friend and interviewed him, and it turned out to be one of the best features we've ever had, so that's quite nice. So nice, smiley, happy, like positive vibes all the way through. Quite nice and friendly. Uh, this is another recent one, Holly McVeigh, brilliant. Uh, let's skip through these, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, so yeah, another way, um, basically, after the albums of the month, that takes up, what, like eight pages. I've still got to fill up the rest of the 64-page magazine, so I had to think of some other ways of filling up space quickly so that every two weeks I could just hound whoever I need to get stuff off, and they just send it to me and I put it in. That's like the idea behind it. So I thought, yeah, I would just get like regular contributors and lock them down so that they are in for the long run with me and it will all be fine. So we have, I thought it'd be great to have an agony aunt, so I thought who is uh, the best person that I could get to do that? Um, and it's Jonathan Richman, who used to be in The Modern Lovers, which is great. He's almost like uncontactable. Uh, every month we get a band or a musician to do the horoscope, which is great. And they actually say yes, and they do it. And they're illustrated by Adam Higdon. We have the staff picks. We have lots of artists and bands just coming into the shop. So the John, like John Malkovich came in to sign some books one day, and he ended up doing a feature. That takes up, that's like, I can just get a photographer to come in quickly. I can do the interview. And then we can just transcribe that and get the photos in quite quickly. That's the same with Martha Wainwright. So these can kind of these features are lovely, and they involve artists kind of talking about music, and it's very artist-centric, but quite easy for me to create. Um, and same, we get staff to kind of do guides to genres and that kind of thing. The best feature, which I'm about to show you, is 
Basically, an email got leaked at Rough Trade. There's a guy who works in mail order called Joff, and he made a document on his computer, and it was a list of all the things he's scared of in this world, and it got found and sent around to everyone. Um, this is the list. Well, there's loads more. This is like a tiny portion of the list, but it's just stuff that he's scared of. So, like, the theater, yogurt, swallowing my tongue, rats climbing out of toilets, um, you know, like he's never tried a peanut in case he's allergic to them. He's a really weird guy, great guy. Um, there's more here. I mean, like, it's quite odd. Anyway, it was really funny, and we all found it hilarious. Because um, <laughs> it is funny. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I haven't got time. So I just said to him, this guy in mail order, I was like, do you want your own monthly column? And he was like, yeah, all right. So that's a monthly feature. He just describes why he's scared of one particular thing and goes through the list. <laughs> um, hey, cool, thanks. Uh, or another way of filling up space very quickly and cheaply for me is to hand it to the band. So I often just send bands money to do features themselves. So I send boy bands for like digital cameras or disposable cameras, and they document their tour and make a diary and send me the photos. And they always send them, even though I think they'll never get around to it, but they do. So these are bands that just send in photos of themselves. This, is, this costs me nothing and fills up lots of space and looks great. So it's like a fantastic win-win <laughs> situation. Uh, or I get bands who I know are really into making their own artwork to kind of do comics and things. And again, that was like a, that was Tim Presley from a band called White Fence. That's like a 10-page comic. So that issue was just fantastic because um, his work's great. And yeah, he was quite pleased to get the opportunity to do that as well. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here. I've just, yeah, to be honest, the, the magazine budget, 64 pages per month for contributors is 1,000 pounds. So it's not much per page. So I have to like really like scrimp around. So a lot of the time I just like take the photos myself because I haven't, I don't know what else I can do. I run out of money in like 10 seconds. So I, this is a feature that I just went and shot inside of a label called Daptone in New York. It's a fantastic label. And we get staff to do collages of the stuff they're into, which is really nice um, to get around the budget situation. And it lets staff, you know, um, be really like show their passions and kind of get involved in the magazine and that kind of thing. Uh, this is just something I found. Some guy wrote this online. I just emailed him and said, can I put it in the magazine? He was like, yeah. And then I just put it in. It's uh, entries on Rolling Stone's top 500 albums of all time list whose titles sound like fart jokes. Um, so it doesn't really, this is not like a news magazine. It's just, to be honest, it's the kind of magazine that I ideally would like to see a stack of by someone's toilet. It's not, it's not meant to be giving you um, kind of you know, up-to-date news. It's just kind of full of these silly things. Uh, also, we run out of budget every month. Uh, we never have a cover. So me and Bruce often end up making the cover ourselves. But that's, some of our best covers have actually come out of that. This is a collage cover that we did just with all the photos from the magazine in Hearts. That was just a quote from the horoscope that month, put over a picture from the magazine. Kind of the best things kind of happen at like two in the morning before we go to print, where we're just like, we've run out of money and time. And uh, yeah, that's kind of when the best things happen. Uh, so just quickly also to get around, I'm talking about money a lot, but it's just, I think about it a lot because we haven't got any. But a way to get around, because we don't use press photos as a rule, a way to get around that is just by using collages, because you can kind of get away with using anyone's images, but in a collage. So this is an interview with Ricky Gervais that we did, and they sent us loads of press photos. And we were like, oh god, they're awful. So we just like made collages instead. And we still use the press photos, but we just kind of cut them up and make them more interesting. This is by an artist called James Springle, who works for us quite a lot. Uh, same as this. this really bad press photos for Kirk from Metallica, as you can imagine. But we can kind of like, if we cut them up and move them around a bit, then we get away with it. Uh, same as this, we just kind of cut things up to make them look more interesting when we can't afford to commission photographers. Um, same here, same here. Uh, and this is the latest issue, which is number 12. And it's just come out now. So it's been a year of doing this. And it's completely, it's so not hard. It's, when I first started, I was so scared that I would have to do this every two weeks. But now it's like, I honestly just turn up to work every day at 10. And I go in and I have a coffee and I have a chat. And then, I don't know, like go for a fag outside and buy a record and chat more and mess around and hang out with mail order. 
and then I, we get drunk at the end of the day because there's a band playing like every day in Rough Trade. And then I go home, and then at the end of the month, this magazine comes out, and I don't know where it's from. And it just like, <laughs> just pops out. Um. <laughs> and this is all of them. Um, so in my last 15 seconds, yeah, I kind of, my one, my, my first aim when I got that job was just to kind of make a really cool magazine and like be cool, uh, make a music magazine and just be like, yeah, making a music magazine. But since in the last 12 issues, it's basically evolved to be a shop magazine, not a music magazine. It's meant, it's kind of encapsulated like what it's like to work there, to be there, to shop there, to be part of it and to turn up and the lovely staff all now contribute to it. And when I see them like reading it, when, they, when the issue comes back off press and their names are in it, they're like, whoa, because they're like, now oh, a published writer and that feels really good. Uh, this is all the staff here. Um, so yeah, I've kind of made, hopefully made something that the staff can be proud of being in, can be proud of selling and that the shop, it kind of sums up being in the shop really. Um, so yeah, sorry for talking like 500 miles an hour, but that's it. Well done. Um, I just think that like it's always immediately obvious like when someone's having fun making a magazine, <laughs> it just jumps off the page. And um, you like so you worked freelance for a little bit, right? You yeah. were like you worked on your own. Yeah, I hated it. Didn't go down so well. No, I was so lonely. Um, yeah, I was so sad. <laughs> I love colleagues. And so now you're in an office environment. I haven't got a team. That's the one thing I really would like is to have at least an assistant to be like, what are you doing? Not, not me saying that to them, them saying that to me. Um, That's not normally what assistants do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just to at least have someone to talk about my ideas with. Me and Bruce talk a lot about stuff, but he's mainly on the design. He designs the whole thing in like three days. So we don't really have to, we don't talk until the design part, which is crazy because we're both just busy. I would love to have a team. I've got mail order, I hang out with them, but they, they don't really, they don't really, <laughs> they don't really care if it fucks up, so. <laughs> All right, Liv, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Cheers.